Good morning. My name is Lloyd El Elwell. I'm one of the elders here at Grace Communion in Hanover. I welcome you to our, our sermon this morning. Um, if you'd all join me in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for calling us out of this world to be here, to, uh, to worship you in spirit and truth. And Lord, we just ask you now to guide the words of the, the speaker. Put your words in his mouth because your words are the words of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're giving uh, uh, Pastor Bill a, uh, uh, a Sunday off because so he can sit and drink coffee and, and watch somebody else do the preaching. He, but he's doing the worship leading, so he's, and he's almost as good a worship leader as he is a, a preacher. So we'll, uh, he's having some fun. Well, good morning. Um, when I was in Army basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, near the end of it, one morning we got up and we did CBN training, that's chemical, biological, and nuclear uh, warfare training. Uh, we marched in formation. It was really unusual. We marched in formation, okay, full platoon formation. We had our unit flags out and the national ensign, the, the stars and stripes was in leading, and we had our weapons, and we didn't have any bullets, but we had weapons, and we were lean, mean, and green, real soldiers, or almost anyway. But we arrived at the sickly green concrete building that was the gas chamber where we were going to be doing our training. But we were, we, were, we were lined up in full array. you got to imagine this. Imagine this. Five platoons of men, 48 each, full complement of NCOs, non-commissioned officers, and the officers from the company commander all the way down. The flags were unfurled. They were blowing in the breeze. <coughs> And we were all standing tall because we were no longer untrained civilians. We had embraced the military life. We were soldiers. We were warriors. Suddenly, somebody yelled, gas! So, following my training, I took my weapon, and I put it between my knees and kept the butt off the ground because it might be contaminated. Then I deftly extracted my gas mask from the from the carrier, flipped it forward to get the, the straps out of the way, put it on my head, pulled hard while I breathed out really hard because you got to blow out anything that might have got trapped in there. And then I tightened them. Then I put my hands over the canisters and sucked in really hard to make sure that that seal was, was right. Then I replaced my helmet, reslung my weapon, and stood tall. And I did all of that in less than nine seconds because that's how we had trained. And as I looked around, I found myself standing nearly alone. There was about a half dozen of us that stayed. The rest of the entire company was heading for the tree line about a mile away with the NCOs screaming and chasing them, trying to get them to come back. One guy they didn't find for three days. So the contrast between the... Um, so there was a big contrast between those that stayed and obeyed our training and those that took off, uh, that ran, and it underscores the weight of their choices. Those of us that stayed obeyed our training and traded our untrained civilian lives for a superior trained military life. And the others hadn't quite accomplished that yet. They reverted to their civilian life and ran away. Um, those of us that stayed had traded the untrained civilian life for the superior trained military life. Why? Well, <laughs> because it was better, because we were in the military and we were looking down the road. We, we could, in the next few years, find ourselves in that exact situation. Well, today's scripture, we're going to look at uh, a first century group of people who may be who many believe were also thinking about trading a superior life, uh, trading, uh, trading a superior life for an, an inferior one. So for those of you who want to follow along, uh, we'll be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Um, now there's some disputation about who wrote the book of Hebrews and to whom it was addressed. I will not bore you with that discussion um, this morning. So uh, I will use the terms the author, and the readers. Now, the book calls itself a word of exhortation. 
chapter 13, verse 22, which means a sermon. And indeed, the book is, is like a sermon or a series of sermons. And it's evident um, in the book that the, the readers were being persecuted. Hebrews 10, 34 states, and property was plundered. Uh, but Hebrews 12, 4 tells us, thankfully, nobody had been killed. Well, now, whether the, the author is directing the book to address the situation of the, of the persecuted, thinking of returning to their old beliefs or not, he successfully exhorts them by arguing the superiority of Christ, hoping that they will renew their commitment to him. And in our section this morning, he argues that Christ is the superior high priest. Okay? So he begins in verse 1. I'll be reading from the ESV, English Standard Version. It says, in verse 1, it says, For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So first of all, we find out that a high priest, all high priests are chosen by God. This is something that you can just say, oh, I want to be a high priest. No, it's you are chosen by God. And it says, from among men, just as Aaron, the first high priest, was chosen from the the tribes of Israel. And then it uses the word to, which means for the purpose of mediating between man and God on humanity's behalf. And mediation is simply being the go-between, that is, presenting man's needs to God. How? By offering gifts. Now, that Greek, I don't bore you with the Greek grammar because I don't know it myself that well, but I do know that in this case it's that, that it means not once but continually. So he was to get, continually offer gifts and sacrifices for their sins. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. So the high priest is to deal gently with the people. And that word gently, the Greek word that's used for gently there is a Greek word that is found only in Hebrews in this verse. And it has a sense of, as Thayer put it, Thayer was a theologian who wrote a, a, a lexicon. He says, one who is not unduly disturbed by the errors, faults, and sins of others, but bears them gently. So who are they supposed to treat gently? Well, it says the ignorant and the wayward. And who is ignorant and wayward? Sinners. And what are all of us? Sinners. So he was supposed, they were supposed to treat everybody gently and to help them uh, as, they, as they progressed. Now, <coughs> that must have, the, I, I can imagine, I put myself in that situation, I can imagine those readers going, what? Because truly the high priests were not known for being particularly gentle uh, to their congregation. Look at what Caiaphas, for example, did to Jesus. Okay, and there's other examples you can see in, in the Bible. Um, but he also makes the point that the high priest is beset by weakness. So he, like them, is also a sinner. All right, so the, the author is reminding that to everybody that the high priest is a sinner too. Uh, verse 3. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. Now, because the high priest is a sinner, he's obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins. And that Greek Greek grammar still speaks to the idea of continually. All right, he has to continually uh, offer sacrifices for his own sins. Um, And he's also uh, obligated to offer sacrifices for the people continually. So the, offer, so the high priest offerings are not some separate, better, or unneeded sacrifice. He needs them too. He's just a human, and he's just as much in need of sacrifices as they are. Verse 4, and no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. Now, the author reiterates the emphasis, the fact, as stated before, that God chooses the high priest. And he's now naming Aaron. Now, if you want to read about that, you can find that in Exodus 28. Um, But there is an importance to this, that he mentions Aaron. 
Okay, and we'll get into it just a little bit later in this. And at the time, the high priest and temple administration were riddled with graphs, so positions were often bought. So, th th again, the people must have gone, what is he talking about? So let's sum it up, though. What is a high priest? He's appointed by God, mediated for humanity to God, and continually offers sacrifices and gifts. Now the author begins to talk about Christ. He compares Christ to those requirements. He starts out in verse 5. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. So Christ did not exalt himself. He was appointed by God like the human high priest. And here the author quotes Psalm 2, declaring him the son. Now, by doing this, the author is declaring, also declaring Jesus is God, that he's divine. He is the son of God. And as a divine son and the father, Christ would have had every right to declare himself a high priest, but he did not. Why? Because Christ is humble. All right? <clears throat> he goes on, as he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here he quotes um, Psalm 110, which proves Christ's divine appointment to the position. Now, of the Melchizedek order, if, you want, if, if you're really interested in reading this, the story of Melchizedek, you go, you'll find it in, in Genesis 14. And to break it down basically, what happened was Abraham went out to war, he, he, he conquered, and he won the war, and he was bringing the spoils back, and Melchizedek came out from Salem, which many people believe was we call now today Jerusalem. And he came out, and Abraham paid him a tithe, that is, he as the priest of God. Now, by doing that, Aaron, who was a descendant of, of Abraham, and so by fiat, he also paid those tithes, which shows that the Melchizedek, all it's the saying is the Melchizedek order is above the Levitical order, okay? It's more important. It's superior. Now, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his, of his reverence. Now, he uses the, the, in the days of his flesh, it's kind of a poetic way to describe Jesus' uh, physical life, uh, or at least his earthly life. Uh, the emphasis is that Jesus was also human, all right, just like them, and relied on God. They understood, and as we do, uh, must have understood that, that his being heard was because of his reverent submission. Remember in Matthew 26, 39 and 42, and Mark 14, 36, he says, not as I will, but as you will, when he was in the garden. Now, the readers would know that he died on the cross, uh, so salvation from death was not the, was not the, the first death, was not um, what he meant, because although that's a portal, we, we, um, none of us are looking forward to going to, I don't think. Um, but they would understand that God they love and trust raised Jesus from death, defeating death itself, and saving them all. So in his priestly role as both fully human and fully God, divine, Jesus Christ was the full and complete sacrifice for the sins of humankind. So let's, <clears throat> let's sum it up. First of all, Christ, we've read Christ was appointed by God. And second, we've, we have read that he was an intermediary. He's the mediator between humanity and God. In fact, the only mediator. And, but offered sacrifices, there's no mention here. Well, if you take... In, look in Hebrews and go back to chapter 2 and verse 17. It says, A merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation or atonement, sacrifice, for the sins of the people. So it's always important when we're, when we're looking at Scripture to consider the entire context. You might find something, you might think something's missing, but if you look a little few verses later, a few verses before, you might find it. So context is always important, not only just the immediate context, but the whole book, the whole New Testament, and the whole Bible itself. So now we get to the, now he 
takes a different tack. And so what he does is he, he, he sums up Christ's qualifications. In verse 8, he says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. You see, Christ is a divine member of the Trinity. He's the son. Christ chose to identify himself, though, with humanity in the incarnation, becoming fully God and fully human. And to fully identify with humankind, he needed to learn obedience and suffer uh, the common fate of all humanity. See, the readers are, are suffering persecution. And they, they would know that Jesus walked the entire road all the way to martyrdom. Jesus, even though he was the son, was just like them. Jesus didn't get any free passes. He had to go through everything that we humans have to go through too. Verse 9. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being made perfect so certainly doesn't, he's not referring to moral perfection. We all know that Jesus was perfect. Um, and we know that, and I'm sure that this congregation knew that. Christ was made a, a perfect human being by the things he suffered in his perfect responses to God. Now, this is very important, the perfect responses to God. Christ responded to everything that he came into in the way that we are intended or were, were intended to respond. And so by, resp by, but the wonderful thing is that his responses, because he sent the Holy Spirit, are now made available to us through the Holy Spirit. So there's a double mediation there. The, the Holy Spirit gives, gives um, access to the responses of Christ. And Christ's responses can then be, be dispensed to us in, by the Holy Spirit. So you can see that they were both working together, and they both had to be there, because if the Holy Spirit was here but Jesus hadn't done any of those responses, there wouldn't be any responses. And the, on the other hand, if Jesus had done these responses but the Holy Spirit wasn't with us, we wouldn't have no access to them. And so this double mediation is very important. <clears throat> is very important. Now, not only did he become perfect, but he also became the source of salvation. You see, he satisfied all the requirements because he was fully God and fully human. I've talked about this many times, but we, we go back to the soteriological axioms, the laws of salvation. There are only two. Only God can save, and God can save only what he's become. And Jesus was fully God, so he was perfectly capable of saving, and he was also fully human, so he had become what he was saving. So he satisfied the, the soteriological axioms completely. And his sacrifice, therefore, was a perfect sacrifice. It was Christ's work as the eternal son and holy and human divine high priest appointed by God who identified totally and perfectly with all humanity to the point of obediently suffering death. That salvation came to him. He is now raised to a state befitting him to his heavenly majesty. Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And finally, in verse 10, he says, being designated by God as a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. See, our author ends on a high and encouraging note, something those being persecuted would find helpful. He he reiterated that God de designated a, a Jesus as high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, he's, a su he's superior to the Levitical and the Melchizedek um, orders in a status all his own. And as a son, he is an eternal high priest, un unlike the high priest, human high priest, who died. Okay, well, yeah, but, you know, we haven't had a high priest in since 70 AD, so what's this got to do with me? Well, that's, that's, an important, that's an important question. So how do we apply this to our times? Well, the application means more than just following commands, okay? Following imperatives, the commands are always important, but it can also be about what we learn. And my first application of this passage is that we've learned much about Jesus. Jesus is in a relationship with his father as the father's forever high priest, 
We see that Jesus is God, verse 5, called by God to that position, verse 5, and will be that high priest forever, verse 6. Our Savior is fully human, 7 and 8, can and does empathize with our situation and deal gently with us as he had to learn obedience and offer prayers, just as we do, verses 7 and 8. The fully human Jesus can also mediate between the earthly and the heavenly and provides us with a merciful and faithful high priest to make propitiation or atonement uh, for the sins of the people, Hebrews 2.17, completing this double mediation of God to man and man to God. Jesus lived a perfect life with no need to sacrifice for himself, verse 9. Um, Christ's high priesthood is superior, and it's, it's a different classification, verse 10, becoming the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, verse 9. So we learned a lot about Jesus, and superficially we might stop there, but <laughs> there's a lot more than that. The next application I take is that of leadership and ministry. Our author emphasizes the importance of the divine calling and compassion in spiritual leadership. The scripture sets a standard for those in leadership to be empathetic, humble, and aware of their calling. God expected the human high priest to treat his people gently. Yes, the ones that were immature and were wayward and were sinners. Christ, as fully human, went through all that he did so that he could be our advocate. See, God is setting his standard of leadership, and he requires a gentle hand, one who is not unduly disturbed by errors, faults, sins of others, but bears them gently. Another bit of application I received from our pericope is that suffering believers can, be, can find encouragement and comfort in knowing that Jesus understands their struggles and has overcome them himself. He suffered just as we do. Now, we in the USA don't face persecution like some of our brothers and sisters around the world, but we can trust him when we give our lives to him and have confidence and hope in him. No matter what things look like out there, we know that he is bigger than all that. We can trust him because he is fully human and fully God, the God that saves. We Americans especially are very individualistic. and We throw around phrases and proverbs like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which we moderns take to mean to build yourself up. Uh, originally, it meant exactly the opposite, because if you've ever tried it, there's no way you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or they sometimes say, God helps those who help themselves. And again, a proclamation of independence that the Bible does not support. Our author tells us we have a Savior who is more human than we are. He is the human that in his life and his responses to God are what we are supposed to and have, were meant to have. Yet, simultaneously, he is fully God with all the power and might that means, and we have access through the Holy Spirit to his responses. He is our forever high priest intervening for us, as it says, a merciful and faithful high priest. We need not go alone. But there's still more. The scripture invites Christians to explore the depth of Jesus' role as their high priest and to, to develop a closer, more obedient relationship with him, remi remaining faithful and trusting that their suffering and the trials have purpose and value. He indirectly calls believers to grow in spiritual maturity. By understanding and appreciating Jesus' high priesthood, Christians are encouraged to deepen their faith and understanding. He is fully human. It should be no surprise to us that as a human, we suffer, right? Our Savior suffered also far more than any of us probably will. He too had to respond to the Father as a human and gave up his life as an example. We won't do it perfectly, as he did. Our individualism won't serve us that way. The author is calling us to imitate Jesus and rely on him. 
We can trust God who has given us the perfect, divine, forever high priest. His love for and plan for us is so profound that Jesus responded perfectly. And in his perfect response as a human and his divinity together, he is the perfect sacrifice for our sins and saves us. Our salvation is not a what, it is a who, Jesus Christ. Finally, our further response can be nothing less than to have our faith strengthened, just as the original audience did. This strengthening of our faith should give us trust, hope, and courage to obey the Great Commission, not in some legalistic way, but to appreciate what we have in Christ. As we go, we must reach out to this sin-sick world, making disciples. They don't know God. They don't know this Jesus who died for them so that they may have eternal life. Most tend to think of him as a fairy tale, or worse yet, a bearded being throwing lightning bolts who hates us and wants to catch us in our faults. We live in a kind of a crazy world. Since I was a child, the world has changed a lot. Yet, in all that chaos and confusion, we have a superior, forever high priest who will mediate for us in a powerful, perfect, and permanent way to live in the presence of God through eternity. He is our Savior and very source of that salvation. In the light of this strengthened faith, based on the knowledge gained of, of the one who made us, and gratitude for his unwavering grace, we can and should renew our commitment daily to Christ, the source of our salvation. Our pericope lives up to its theme that Jesus is a better, the better high priest. All right, so now for those of you at home, if you gather up your, your communion, we'll have communion now, and Pastors Brockmeyer and Lane will... Please pass out the elements. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. After the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples went out to the Mount of Olives. You can find that in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 16. Um, there he said... Um, this to his disciples, Matthew 26, 31. This very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. That's from Zechariah 13, 7. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Now Peter, Peter immediately tries to contradict Jesus by foolishly saying he would not fall away. He even insisted that he would not disown Jesus, even if he had to die. And most Bibles, if they have a description phrase before this bit of scripture, label it as Jesus predicting Peter's denial. However, I want to point out that in Matthew 26, 35b, uh, there's a sentence that says, and all the other disciples said the same. So to my way of thinking, Peter was more verbal about it, as we often see him in scripture, but he's not alone in declaring he would not disown Jesus, even if it meant his death. Notice also that Jesus predicted you will all fall away. I'd love to say that if it were me there, I would not have disowned Jesus, but I know that I would have run too. <laughs> um, how do I know that? Well, how many times have I run away? Sinned and denied, uh, sinned and did other shameful things, unworthy things. Just because of the discomfort of denying my flesh for a moment, let alone pain unto death. Um, you see, in like ways, he has, he has taken our sin, betrayal, shame, and unworthiness also. And this table, this holy supper, and Jesus' enactment of the new covenant for the remission of sins in his body and blood is for all of us as well. In it, we need to understand that Jesus, the crucified Messiah, and, uh, and to the salvation and love of God. So if you please join me. In prayer, thank you, Lord, for the wonderful sacrifice of Christ. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful mediation that we have in Christ, and we thank you that he is our superior high priest. Lord, we thank you 
And we ask you now to guide us and protect us always. In Jesus' name we pray. In 1 Corinthians it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 it says, um, on that night he, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of Christ. Also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, the blood of the new covenant. If you'd like to support our ministries, um, I believe there's a slide that shows you. Shows you. Um, you can go to our website or you can text your contribution to 804-409-0445. Uh, better yet, we have envelopes in the back. So come on down to 7300 Hanover Green Drive uh, in Old Mechanicsville and join us. Grab one of those envelopes and put it, put it in the, uh, the bucket down here in the front. Um, may God keep you all uh, until we come uh, together again.